There is a belief that improving traffic flow simply requires widening roads and adding more routes. Time after time, this has been proven to be counterintuitive. Commute times may appear better shortly after the project is completed, but as commuters learn about improved trip times, they begin converging along the same route at the same times, even abandoning public transit because driving became better. The increased number of vehicles results in commute times being worse than when the project originally began. This is an effect known as induced demand, and rather than learning from the mistakes, what usually ends up happening is the city decides another revision is necessary. More buildings must be demolished, and more people must be displaced, all for the sake of improving car travel. This is why defeating traffic is a monumental task. There is so much focus on cars that any other viable alternative is neglected. There is a painful knowledge gap where the general public doesn't seem to understand how mass transit and micromobility projects can be more beneficial than expanding freeways, which has led to the rise of various grifters who try to butter people up so they can buy into a wild and crazy scheme that doesn't at all address traffic issues. Elon Musk has gone on record to dismiss induced demand, saying it is one of the most irrational theories he has ever heard. This is a frequent talking point of his, and he reiterated it on May 10th of this year during an interview with Financial Times. Right, so if you look at, say for instance, Robert Moses in New York built loads of highways, they were supposed to solve congestion, and all they did was led to more congestion. How do you avoid tunnels doing exactly the same, but just being very expensive in the process? <laughs> um, I have to say the, this, this notion of induced demand is one of the single dumbest notions I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, if, 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 you know, if adding roads just increases traffic, why don't we delete them and decrease traffic? And I think you'd have an uproar if you did that. He then goes on to discuss that we just need to add more lanes vertically because buildings are in three-dimensional space and roads are two-dimensional. As easy as it is to clown Elon Musk for his bad traffic takes, he does make one good point. What if instead of expanding roads and adding new routes, we began carefully removing different streets and roads in order to improve traffic flow? Historically, there have been times where closing a busy road had either a negligible effect on commute times or it actually improved traffic flow. On Earth Day in 1990, New York City's Transportation Commissioner decided to close 42nd Street for that year's Earth Day. This street was infamous for its congestion issues, and people feared the traffic would impact the surrounding streets. Many predicted it would be doomsday, said the city's commissioner. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or have a sophisticated computer queuing model to see that this could have been a major problem. To everyone's surprise, there was no historic traffic jam. In fact, the closure improved commute times for the day. This is a phenomenon that can be explained with Bray's paradox. Imagine the following network with two routes to get from point A to point B. Each route takes the same amount of time, with a portion requiring 15 minutes to traverse and the other portion taking a variable amount of time, depending on the amount of traffic. Since neither route is better than the other, traffic flow is split evenly between both routes. If 4,000 cars flow through this network and they are evenly distributed, the total commute takes only 20 minutes for everyone. The city may eventually decide that they can do better and add a shortcut that only takes two minutes to traverse. With this new model, when the same 4,000 cars move through the system, they notice that the new route is so much better than the other two that they all want to drive on it. The travel time for the route that is actually used increases to 22 minutes for the entire commute, which is slightly longer than in the original system. Giving drivers more choices for which routes they follow is not an inherent benefit for traffic flow. People will selfishly choose the route that appears faster for themselves, even if the consequences of pooling everyone onto the same route outweigh any of the benefits. The city could expand capacity with one more lane, or they could spend ages boring tunnels meant to transport cars along three dimensions, but a much simpler solution is to simply get rid of it. It may be a paradox, but it actually makes complete sense. If widening freeways worsens congestion overall, then the opposite action should have the opposite effect. Congestion is always thought of as a capacity or throughput issue, when it is actually more of a distribution and mode of transportation issue. 
Our cities are built in a way that requires people to drive. So during rush hour, a lot of cars are being squeezed into various bottlenecks found throughout the city. Residential communities are typically swaths of single-family homes with various cul-de-sacs and relatively narrow streets that connect to wider arterial roadways that bring people to wherever they are trying to go. Every morning while people are dropping kids off at school, grabbing a pick-me-up from McDonald's or Starbucks, and doing whatever else in their morning routine before heading to work, we see a flood of vehicles from every suburban community to every workplace. In the evening, this process is repeated in reverse. The typical solution is to widen the roads to better accommodate the number of vehicles that are traveling through them during peak hours. However, adding more lanes is not the solution. Over the past few decades, billions of dollars have been spent, and entire communities have been either separated or raised to add thousands of new miles to existing freeways just for the result to be more congestion. In March 2020, Transportation for America released a report titled The Congestion Con, which delved into the amount of time and money that is wasted on freeway revisions. This report found that we have added 30,511 new freeway lane miles of road in the largest 100 urbanized areas in the U.S. between 1993 and 2017, an increase of 42%. That rate of road expansion significantly outstripped the 32% growth in population in those 100 regions over that time. Cities are expanding their roads faster than the population, but despite these investments, the total annual hours of delay in the nation's top 100 urbanized areas has increased by a whopping 144%. It may seem reasonable to blame increased delays on population growth, but no matter if freeways are expanded at a similar rate to population, faster than the population, or with no change in the population, delays have increased whenever new freeway lane miles are added. The problem isn't the roads, whereas there being too much driving. In 1993, on average, each person accounted for 21 miles of driving per day, and by 2017, that number had jumped to 25 miles per day. This is a direct result of the naive methods urban planners used to reduce congestion. For decades, cities have been built to minimize density and separate any commercial and residential buildings under the impression that it is beneficial for traffic flow. However, suburban sprawl actually increases vehicle trips by making it more difficult to access various points of interest without a car. In a city with dense mixed-use developments, someone can easily run their errands without many vehicle trips because they can simply walk to places. Conversely, when buildings are further spread out, it may be more difficult to walk or ride a bike somewhere, leading to the car being the only option. So people find themselves driving across the strode and between parking lots. So if freeway expansions fail to provide any relief to existing traffic and congestion issues, what would happen if we were to approach this problem differently? And instead of adding more and more lanes, we apply Bray's paradox and not only narrow freeways, but get rid of them entirely. Seattle's Alaskan Way Viaduct helps answer this question. In January 2019, there was a strange period of time where the Alaskan Way Viaduct had to be closed down for three weeks before the replacement tunnel could open. There was a lot of uncertainty regarding what would happen during this time span. People assumed that either there would be an insufferable amount of congestion spilling into the surrounding areas, making downtown travel impossible, or people would change their habits and find other ways to get around without the viaduct. What happened was the latter of the two options. People changed their habits and found other ways to avoid the affected areas. The Seattle Department of Transportation has compiled a report on how traffic volumes changed during these three weeks. What they found was, there were fewer people driving through the downtown area during these three weeks than compared to a similar time span from September 2018. Transit ridership also saw a modest increase compared to the 2018 baseline, with the exclusion of the second week because of a holiday. More people were taking light rail and the waterfront shuttle instead of driving. Bike ridership also saw a substantial increase despite Seattle's weather. There are a lot more people who opted to ride their bikes during the viaduct's closure than compared to the previous year, which really goes to show that cold and rainy weather doesn't necessarily stop people from using bikes as transportation. 
Finally, some trips just didn't happen. When surveying different employees from some of the largest downtown employers, a substantial percentage of people opted to work from home. Nothing about the density or the population changed during these three weeks. The only difference is that there was one fewer road to drive on, which caused people to change their habits so they can maintain a comfortable commute. Once the replacement tunnel opened, everything went back to normal. But the short time span demonstrates that not only can a city afford to lose a freeway, but maybe our cities don't need them at all. Fixing traffic begins with recognizing that the current solution of widening roads and creating new shortcuts is not working. It is a bit of a paradox, but commutes have to be worsened for cars, so fewer people choose to drive, and the remaining people who actually have to drive can have a more pleasant commute. Everyone is going to be a little selfish. They are going to instinctually take the fastest, most direct route during their commutes. The transportation system must take advantage of this and direct priority away from cars to reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled. Cities must stop inducing demand for a select few roads and highways and direct people into alternatives. This can be done by applying Bray's Paradox and removing certain roads from the traffic network in a way that distributes commuters onto different routes and onto different modes of transportation entirely. This does not mean to completely bulldoze the streets and the roads, whereas to repurpose them as pedestrian-only streets, protected bike lanes, or bus-only lanes. In an ideal traffic system, people who commute by foot or by bike should have more direct routes to the places they are going, while people in cars should have longer, more roundabout trips to get to the same location. Buses and trams should be in their own dedicated lanes and be given priority at stoplights, while cars should be expected to wait in the traffic that they are producing. It may sound somewhat counterintuitive, but the best way to defeat traffic is not to widen freeways and create more shortcuts in the traffic network, whereas to build a traffic network where the car isn't the default option.